welcome to Rivers in the Desert, a revival ministry dedicated to bringing the living waters of God's love to a hurting and dying world. It is our desire as you listen to the following message that the Holy Spirit will fill you afresh and that you would be ignited into a fervency for Jesus. This is the day to be filled with the knowledge of His glory as the waters cover the sea. God is doing something new on planet Earth today, and you and I have the great privilege to be a part of it. We love you. Be blessed. on something this is what I'm telling you to do. And I said, okay, Lord, well, your will be done, not my will. Amen? Amen? So let's turn to the book of Zechariah. Go to Malachi and make a left-hand turn. You'll hit it. Zechariah. Now, what's interesting about Zechariah is that the word, remember God, Zachariah. And uh, it says in verse 1, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Bechariah, the son of Adu, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to him, Thus says the Lord of the armies of heaven, Return to me declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of the armies of heaven. So all it takes for God's blessings is for us to return to him. Do not be like your fathers to whom the fa former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of the armies of heaven, Return now from your evil ways and return from your evil deeds. But they do not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? And then they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dwelt, dealt with us. So notice in verse 6 the word overtake. And, uh, you know, there's a storm surge. A lot of people say, well, we can ride out the high winds. We can ride out, you know, the high tide. We can ride out the rain, the tornadoes, the lightning. But one thing you don't understand is the storm surge that comes. And there's nothing can escape the storm surge. An 18-foot wall of water that's lifted up by a low-pressure system of a hurricane is something you don't mess around with. And notice here it says, the words that God spoke to our fathers overtook us. I don't want to be overtaken. I want to be ready. And verse 7 is how we get ready. On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of which is Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Bechariah, the son of Du, as follows. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, which were in the ravine, red sorrel and white horses behind him. And then I said, My Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said, I'll show you what these are. And the man who was speaking, standing, excuse me, among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So even though you do not think that anything is happening, everything is fine, God's not really watching, he has secret recon, he has patrols going on. And they're listening and they're watching everything that's going on right now. 
And it says in verse 11, So they answered the angel of the Lord who was among, standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. As I've said before, this is not God's will. God doesn't want things peaceful and quiet right now. When you get to heaven, that'll be nice, okay? And even these patrolling spirits, these are not even angels, brothers and sisters. These are supernatural beings on horses that their whole job is to recon, walk to and fro. New American Standard says, patrol the earth. And we see here that they come back and say the earth is peaceful and quiet, and they're upset about that. And you would think, wait, what's, why? i tell you why. Look at verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of the armies of heaven, how long we have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, which has been indignant these 70 years. So the angel is talking to God at intercession, God, what about Jerusalem? Jerusalem has been destroyed. Jerusalem has been ransacked. Uh, pagan nations are, have overtaken the capital, have destroyed the cities of Judah. And the angels are saying, what about the 70-year prophecy? Darius, remember who Darius is, okay, he comes after Daniel. And during Daniel's time, so there's a lot of angelic activity. There's a lot of supernatural activity going on at certain moments in history, and I believe we're at that moment right now. That things may be peaceful and quiet, so to speak. Okay? We live in a beautiful area. We live in America. Things are nice, peaceful, and quiet. Okay? But in the spirit, there's a lot of activity right now. It doesn't take a lot of, you know, spiritual discernment to see that just in the natural, citizens are being bombarded with fear left and right, left and right. Fear about this, fear about that. Major news medias are making a lot of money, okay? Getting a lot of listening time. Their Nielsen ratings are going up because of phobia, because of fear. And I felt to play that this morning. Fear not, O cities of Judah. Fear not, Tel Aviv. Fear not, body of Christ. Amen? Fear not, Christian. Why? Because we've won. Read the end of the book. We win. Hallelujah. And the final enemy that we're under is the fear of death. England is traumatized right now. Traumatized. There's no telling how many more sleeper cells of terrorism are there among the ranks and a large Muslim population in Great Britain. But brothers and sisters, we don't have to be traumatized. We don't have to be scared. If you have to drive an Amtrak to work one day, or the, or the Marta, or a subway, amen, you don't have to sit around and be scared just because it's an orange alert. You need to walk through that thing and pray. Hallelujah. We've got angels around us. Amen. If we get scared, if we get a bomber, bomb shelter mentality, then who, who is there to lead? And so the angels are here, and they don't want the earth to be peaceful and quiet. They want things to be stirred up. Amen. So what's the stirring up? It's a 70-year prophecy of Jerusalem. Keep your finger here. Let's go to Daniel just to recap and get your minds refreshed. Amen. The book of Daniel... It shows us in chapter 9 and verse 1 and 2 that Daniel reads the prophecy of Jeremiah. I won't have to turn to that, but Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 29 saying, don't trust in the deceptive words of these people, these false prophets, just prophesy in good news. Nebuchadnezzar's coming to destroy this city. The city is full of idolatry. You're going to Babylon for 70 years. I'll prosper you. I'll bless you. I'll multiply you in Babylon. But at the end of 70 years, you will seek me with all of your heart, and I will bring you back to this place. Hallelujah. And so that's the crease in history. That's the moment we're reading at right now. Right now. And so Daniel sees that scripture, that prophecy in chapter 9 and verse 1 of Daniel. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. So this is just one, one kingdom or one king away from Esther. Remember Esther, the book of Esther? Okay. Ahasuerus was the king during Esther's time. 
So this is the next king that came up, his son Darius. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the numbers of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, for the completion of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So we see here that he's the only person that stirred himself up. All of the, wouldn't you imagine if somebody came and prophesied to us that, you know, God's going to destroy, you know, Alpharetta, and we're all going to be carried away to Mexico and live in some communist concentration camp. This is all a figment of my imagination right now, okay? This is not real. <laughs> and after 70 years that we would pray to God, we would return and be restored back to our land and our homes and our city. Wouldn't you think that somebody would be keeping track of the number of days that have gone by? Yeah. For whatever reason, folks, we're call, I'm talking about, yes, people are smart in the natural, okay? But let me tell you, people are not wise. Just because you made a certain SAT score, okay, on your college entrance exam, that's because you, you know, you have an ability to, you know, play crossword puzzle and, re and write crossword puzzles, okay? Just because in your part spare time, you're on your cell phone talking, playing chess with a Russian champion, okay? Does not mean that you're really wise. To be wise is to be awake, to be alert. And I feel like our greatest enemy in North America is this, we keep on getting this slumber state. People are slumbering all over the place. It's amazing to me. And so it says here in verse 2 that he observed in the books. We need to be reading the Bible and observing what are the prophecies that are about to happen. And it says that he sought God with prayer and fasting, verse 3. And he cried out, and you can read about that. And God showed him in verse 24, not just the return of the Jewish people back to Jerusalem, but the, 20, the 70 weeks of the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? showed him over here in verse in chapter 12 the end of days see when you seek him to press into God to seek him he gives you more than what you asked for he just wanted to go back to Israel he wanted to go back home but God revealed to him the mystery of the end of time it says in verse 2 of chapter 12 and many of those who awake who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt So he shows them the resurrection of the dead. Did you know if you want to get these mysteries, you're going to have to battle with the Prince of Persia, so to speak? That just because you find out something and God wants you to pray and you pray and press it, does that mean the battle's over? Daniel, 21 days to battle this unseen principality, the Prince of Persia, and Michael, the chief warrior angel, had to come and help out. That's quite a backyard brawl, isn't it? Dan think about it. And if Daniel didn't press in, Israel could still be in Babylon today. And all it takes for the triumph of evil is good men and women do nothing. And so if God's given you a word, even just a micro word, not a macro word like Daniel got, even a micro word, if you're not faithful to that and faithful to the details of what God says to you, it affects other people. You know, we're in a, you know, we are a body. You know, we're just all these little units walking around. We are a body, right? We're, we're, we're associated with one another in the spirit. Amen? Glory to God. And so everybody has to do their part. And we have to be awake. And so Daniel wakes up and he prays. And God shows him because of him waking up, there's coming a resurrection of the dead. Verse 3, and those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteous like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, O Daniel, could seal these words, seal up the book in the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. Yes. Back and forth is speaking about mass transit. And, and knowledge will increase is speaking about, I believe, the World Wide Web yes. and the knowledge base being shared worldwide. So during this time, verse 9, God says to him, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up for the end time. I pray that you be released because every time I open up my Bible and start reading, I see new things I never saw before. 
It's like the seals are being broken right now. The mystery, the scrolls are being opened. Hallelujah. It's not new revelation because all the revelation we ever got has already been done. Jesus came and died, resurrected, revealed the revelation. But it's an illumination of what's been already been hidden. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. And it says in verse 10, many will be purged purified and refined. I don't know how long that's going to take, but I'm not going to get mad about it. <laughs> Amen? Many will be, purif be purged, purified, the margin of my uh, Hebrew says, to make white. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. God wants us to have this insight. And so we see here, when Daniel stirs himself up, let's go back to Zechariah chapter 1, he is engaging not just because he misses falafel, not just because he misses, you know, uh, the waters of the Gihon Spring in the city of David, not because he misses, you know, maybe some in-laws that stayed back, okay? He is unknowingly in a time of weariness, but a, a divine discontent is built inside of him. And this divine discontent causes him to search the scriptures of why am I in this state that I'm in? He's already had the miracle of the three Hebrew children. Remember that? And the man of the fourth man appearing in the fire. You all remember those miracles? You should read through Daniel and read all the miracles that he went through, okay? powerful things, yet he's still in a state of divine discontent. And people say, why am I not satisfied? It's because God has a destiny, not just for you, but for the body of Christ, and everybody's got to do their part right now. Amen. 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 And our biggest enemy is laziness. Amen. And I'm not talking about natural, I'm not about a spirit of laziness. I'm not about a spirit of slumber. You have to wrestle yourself. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You have to wrestle. Last night, again, I was awoken, as I was last Sunday morning. Again, I was woken, and I had to do battle. Let me tell you something. Brother Hagin always taught us, you know when it's a demon spirit, when the hair on the back of your neck stands up. And I was awoken again. I was just trying, I'm minding my own business, trying to sleep. <laughs> And I, I'm awoken early this morning by a, 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 by a spirit. And so I just got out of bed and rebuked the thing. Hallelujah. <laughs> Took off and I went back to sleep. But it was very interesting. Is that in this dream, I had found out that there was a portal, as I mentioned last week, there was a portal to the underworld. And I was taking all this demonic things, you know, all these voodoo and, and these dolls and, and paraphernalia that people use to contact that fallen realm, and I had got a bunch of it, and I was throwing it away in the sewer. Hallelujah. But when I opened up the sewer and dropped all the stuff down, the sewer came alive and it opened up and I saw it was one of the gates into hell. And that there were spirits down there. There was a spirit that came and it was dressed in a suit as a businessman, as an executive. And it was a spirit of a spirit of death that was trying to pull people to hell. And then even though things were, you know, very calm like now, but underneath the ground in this sewer hole, portal hell, was a lot of activity of Satan trying to pull men as fast as possible to hell because they know their time is short. Are you listening, brothers and sisters? And so even though things may be quiet here this morning, there is a war going on right now. And the reason we were born again at this time is because you were made for war. Hallelujah. Because each of you are revolutionaries. And I'll explain that in, in a few moments. But anyway, so let's go back to Zechariah chapter 1. And it says here that the angels... In verse 12, and these supernatural beings were upset because the earth was quiet. I tell you, we got to retool. We got to think like, like Jesus does, not like the world. The world wants everything nice and quiet. God wants to stir things up. Why? Because we're violent people. 
the kingdom of God suffers violence. Hallelujah. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? We can't seem to get off that scripture the last three weeks, have we? Violence. Seize it by force, Jesus said. From the time of John the Baptist until now, maybe that was just a few weeks. At the most, it's just a couple years in Jesus' ministry. From the time of John the Baptist until now, Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffering violence. And the violent take it by force. Meaning the ministry of John the Baptist and Jesus, hallelujah, was not Jesus walking around like a smiley Jesus all the time, okay? A happy Jesus. Of course he's full of joy. But he was on a mission. Yeah. To dismantle, to tear down, to confuse, to blind. He healed the blind men and he was blinding the others that were full that were not going to believe in him. We studied last week in Isaiah 13. And so that time, there was a lot of friction, a lot of things happening. From Malachi until the time John the Baptist appeared was a time of preparation. It's where we get all the apocalyptic literature, all of the pseudographical literature, a lot of demonology, a lot of, uh, it's called the in-between time. There was a lot of turmoil. A lot of political factions came up. There was a lot of um, messianic hopes. Uh, the Roman army came in and, and squalched us there. You understand? Know there was a lot of things happening in Israel before John the Baptist shows up. A lot of confusion, a cauldron of superstition. People hoping for the Messiah, wondering why, why, why uh, uh, Alexander the Great came in and destroyed the place. Why, you know, the Maccabeans hey, revolted against the Greek army and won, and it was a miracle. But still, where is the Messiah? The Hasmonean clan. And then the Romans come in. Oh, no. It's like the Floridans saying, oh, we just had four hurricanes last year. Now we got a sister here who just came up from, you know, from Pensacola because of the hurricane. And now it's not just this hurricane, which is now almost a Category 5, just a few hours away. There's another one building outside the East Antilles right now. Another, so it's going to be a quite, you know, uh, this is the strongest hurricane on record this early in season, folks. We're not even in September yet. It's like, oh, what do we do? Another one. So can you imagine the Jewish people? They got rid of the Greeks, and now the Romans came in. And we're in the, in the last prophetic word they have is Malachi. And here's Zachariah going through the, you know, Luke chapter 1. He's walking through in the holy place. He's lighting the incense, okay? He's got a whole group of people praying out there. He's blameless, okay? Him and his wife are advanced in age, okay? And when God says, okay, now, open up the crease. It's time to bring in the violent one, John the Baptist. Hallelujah. He goes, well, I know this for certain. My wife is old, I'm advanced in years. <laughs> Quick, shut his mouth up. <laughs> See, what am I saying? He was in a spiritual stupor. He was going through the motions. You can be in the glory. Folks, he's just a couple meters away from the Shekinah glory. People don't go in there and play backgammon, okay? <laughs> And he's walking, and he's got a whole prayer meeting outside. Wow. you got a bunch of Jewish mothers that are praying. There's messianic smell in the air. Something's happening. And he's not ready. And how do you get ready? You should write this down today. You need to get ready for miracles. You need to get ready, not for a theme or an idea or a speculation or a blessing. You need to get ready for a miracle, supernatural intervention of God. Hallelujah. Something that you can't do and you can't make happen. Your back's up against the wall. Hallelujah. And Zacharias was God's man because he was blameless. He had kept all the commandments, Luke 1 says. He's ready. He's at that moment at the crease in time. And guess what? He's going through the motions in the holy place. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appears to him. Folks, I want to be ready that when an angel appears or God does something, I automatically default into speaking faith and not speaking wonderment and disbelief. Because whatever you've been filling yourself with is what's going to come out. If an angel shows up, you all still believe in angels. I do. Hallelujah. <laughs> if something happens, listen, folks, nothing has happened for 400 years. 
Can you understand that? They're talking about boring church services. <laughs> Nothing's been going on for 400 years, and suddenly Gabriel himself shows up. And what does he do? He defaults into what I call the paralysis of analysis. When you try to analyze, analyze, analyze excuse me, what God is saying, you get into brain tissue, okay, and you will seize up there is not enough RAM to run that program, okay? No matter how much you try to control, alt, delete, and try to restart this thing, you cannot run this thing because it's not brain tissue, it's not brain wave, it's not a thinking process, it's not a logical deduction, it is spirit. Hallelujah. And when God speaks, it's supposed to make you go, uh, uh, tilt, tilt. Why? So he gets all the glory. Amen. Amen. And so your birth's the best answer. You should start practicing this. Hallelujah. Like you did in speech class, you know, before you got up for the first time and you were scared. <laughs> and your heart rate was, and your palms were sweaty and your heart was beating, okay? And you stood up before the class. This is what we need to be saying. You know, Lord. Oh, no, Lord, you know. <laughs> Remember what Ezekiel said? <laughs> Son of man, can these bones live? <laughs> oh, Lord, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or you can probably get by with a, a curious answer. What are these, Lord? <laughs> like Zachar Zachariah did. But don't go, how is this going to happen? <laughs> Because God doesn't like that. Let me tell you, God is not pleased. And we're moving into the passion and pleasure of God this month. And we do not want to do anything that causes God no passion and no pleasure. Amen. Amen. We're created for his pleasure. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. I mean, when the waves hit the shoreline, they go, hallelujah. <laughs> the trees, they clap their hands. All creation is worshiping him. And he expects us to worship with the faith he's given us. Amen? Because when you're top heavy up here, you're the most imbalanced, okay? You gotta be center, you gotta be central heavy right here. You know, that's where your best, you know, balance is. You gotta be more led by the spirit than your brain tissue. Amen. And so what we're talking about today is responding opposite than Zachariah did. And Luke chapter, oh, can I know this for certain? I'm an old man. Quick, shut the guy up. Before he aborts everything. Yeah. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe that will bring awakening to America. Shut up a bunch of preachers on TV. Yeah. Think about it. Mute. Yeah. Suddenly, all the preachers preaching go mute. And people say, what's wrong with my controller? Is this mute button? What's happening to this thing here? <laughs> That'd be a sign of wonder, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll take that. Because when Zacharias is in the holy place and says, you're going to be unable to talk, Gabriel said, because you do not believe my words. We say, give a guy a break. He's an old man. He's almost retired, you know. He's going. He's been doing this a long, hard time. No, I'm not going to give him any break. You know why? Because he said three times a day a miracle of supernatural childbirth. Ever since he was five years old, he's been praying a prayer. Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzhak, Elohei Yaakov. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech What's he saying? Three times a day the Shema Yisrael is to be pronounced. With the blessings, you're the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three times a day, okay? Let's say for 70 years. Say he's 75 years old. For 70 years, three times a day, three times 365 times 70. He is saying, you're the God of our fathers, Abraham, and the miracle baby, Isaac. <laughs> Come on, folks. Hallelujah. 
see, the problem is that we will talk about miracles so much that when it's ready for it to happen, if you're not inside ready to jump, amen, your spirit's not trained, you will automatically default, well, how is it going to happen? It's called mental assent. You agree with the Word, but you don't act on it. You say, well, he's in the glory realm. I only need to see the glory. Folks, the glory of God will soften you or harden you. And any time you pull back from the glory and say, Lord, well, that's a little too bright. Can you put a veil on it for a little bit? You immediately are in unbelief, and you don't know. You just crystallize your faith, and you can't go anywhere with God anymore. Then the children of Israel. Come on, folks. Hallelujah. See, there's some, there's some things we, you know, this is, you know, there's a wind blowing, amen? <laughs> he ain't talking about a hurricane wind or tornado winds are going to hit here next few days. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about a wind of knowing the things of God and knowing how to flow with God, amen? And these things you can't learn in a Bible school. These things are not taught. They are only caught. Hallelujah. And we've got to stay in a moment in a place where the, the, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It gets brighter and brighter to the full day. Hallelujah. And each day it gets brighter in our Lies, we're going to be experiencing more light and more revelation and more conviction, and we can't stop. But as soon as you pull back from that, okay, and want to have a comfortable sun lamp, okay, instead of a piercing light in your life, you immediately crystallize your faith, and only repentance will break up that hard ground. So here, the moment of time, a crease in history, God is going to send the breaker through a supernatural childbirth. Hallelujah. Amen. Why did he need that? Because this supernatural childbirth was going to give encouragement and faith to Mary a few months later that she could have a baby too. Hallelujah. Didn't the angel Gabriel say, even your, your, uh, your cousin Elizabeth is pregnant? Yes. Whoa. Well, I'm young and she's old. Well, I could definitely have a baby then. Be it done to me according to your word, Lord. Hallelujah. See, what happens to you and your faith and your miracle circumstances is going to encourage many other people. It's a domino effect. It's not just about you and I. And so, I'm not arrived, but I tell you something, I can smell something cooking. Hallelujah. I want to continually build my faith that when something supernatural happens, okay, I immediately respond with faith. Hey, I'm going to have a baby. I'm 75 years old. My wife's old too. We're past the pay. Hey, no problem. Be it done to me according to your word. What can I name him? Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, folks. And we got to wretch it up. The torque and the tension against falling into uh, what I'm calling this uh, paralysis of analysis. You say, well, what's the big deal? Back then, well, today in our Hellenistic society, Western society, we don't put a lot of um, blessings on children. You know? A big family back then was a blessing. The more children you had, the more olive trees you had around your tri table. Amen? Here, I walk out, I, I go somewhere and with my five kids, they go, Are those all yours? I'm like, yeah. What? I'm, I'm, I'm strange, you know, for having five kids. I'm fulfilling the first commandment, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Hallelujah. So what's wrong with that? What's the rub, bub? You understand what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, but most of our society, oh, I just want a boy and girl. Yeah. This thing about our society, back then it was a blessing to be pregnant. Hello? I wish our country would wake up that it's a blessing to be pregnant. Amen? It's not a blessing to abort. And so the greatest thing you could have in your life is a retirement plan when you're that age. And what's the best retirement plan? It's not your 401k. You know what it is? Having a bunch of children working for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. 
Pues. <laughs> so listen, there's such a blessing. I've got five kids. And when Jesus tarries, I got five people to take care of me when I get older. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm not trusting no 401k. How about you guys? Well, I'm not saying they throw it away. I'm just saying that don't put your trust in this economy system. Who do you trust? You trust God. And so it's a blessing. So he doesn't have any children. And three times a day for 70 plus years, he's been saying, blessed be the Lord our God of our fathers Abraham, the miracle baby Isaac. And so it comes time. He's righteous. He's blameless. He's a person of the word. Folks, read about his, his, his resume in Luke chapter 1. And suddenly... And that's what God's about to do in our lives. There's going to be a suddenly. Amen. And when that suddenly happens, what's going to, you're either going to automatically default what's inside of you, either faith or fear. You either run away, you'll criticize, or you'll embrace and believe. Hallelujah. I remember when, when this past revival hit, this renewal I got hit in 1993 in Louisville, Kentucky. Hallelujah, in a six-hour service. It was awesome. But there was other people there who were saying, oh, I don't know, this isn't this is like, is like we did in 1932. And what attracted me to the move of God was not all the people getting totally intoxicated and being heavy drinkers at Joel's Bar. What, in, in, what attracted me was the preaching, because it was prophetic. And evangelistic at the same time. I said, I like it. Hallelujah. And I jumped in. I didn't care if I was, had all my shoes on. It wouldn't matter to me. I'm doing swimming. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I haven't come up for air since 1993, almost 12 years now. Hallelujah. It'll be 12 years. I mean, uh, 93. Uh, yeah. It'll be 12 years uh, next, next week. But we're, we can't live on 12 years old manna. Something new is happening. So now we have to push down the powder. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then pack the cannonball behind it and just get ready for something to happen. Boom, automatically it takes off. And your life will never be the same. What's wrong? You all still trying to add up 1993 minus 2005? <laughs> We got to be quick to respond. And so Mary, when the angel comes to her six months later, she responds pretty quickly, doesn't she? Yes. Yes. Glory to God. And it's gonna, it takes this type of anointing to bring in the manifestation of God in our lives. Even the return of Jesus is going to take a John the Baptist generation. And you know what, and if, if, we, if we're just a generation to powder pack ourselves, hallelujah, and one of our children be in that generation, amen, that Jesus comes back in, then I say, well, praise God, that's good enough for me, amen? But I don't know if we have that much time, to tell you the truth. Amen. Things are happening very quickly. And so back to Zechariah 1, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of armies, heaven, how long will have no compassion for Jerusalem? So this intercession is going forth for Jerusalem. And everything in our lives, all the miracles, can be summed up in one macro miracle, which is Jerusalem. There is a war about Jerusalem right now, brothers and sisters. Everything happening in the world right now, okay, you can trace it to Jerusalem. And we can never forget about Jerusalem. And it goes on and says here that the angel... Was ex it says, verse 14, Proclaim, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. There's a jealousy. There's a passion that God has, a divine jealousy for Jerusalem and Zion. The natural Jerusalem and Zion, which is us. We're the heavenly Jer Jerusalem, the heavenly Zion. Glory to God. So how do these miracles happen? Chapter 4 and verse 6. We see the next progression. 
I encourage you to fast from science fiction and instead read Ezekiel and Zechariah. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of the armies of heaven. Everything God's going to do is be by his spirit, okay? We got to de emphasize our mental logic when it comes to Jesus and emphasize over and over walking by the spirit, walking by the ruach, walking by the wind, being people of the wind. Hallelujah. And verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things? These miracles always happen when there's absolute desolation and nothing going on. God created something out of nothing in Genesis 1. It goes on and says in verse 10, but these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the whole earth. What I'm saying is that when God's about to do something new, like it was in Zechariah's day, like it is in our day, that you're going to see a lot of angelic activity, okay? And you're going to see a lot of people getting de disenfranchised and, and uh, just getting disillusioned with normal churchianity. Okay? And they're going to start breaking away into home, home cell groups, home meetings, small churches. Hallelujah. That's why we're here. Glory to God. Maybe that's why you're here on the internet listening. Amen. And there's going to be a divine dissatisfaction within you. But I tell you, you know that the eyes of the Lord are about to do something when you see the plumb line happening. Amen. And what's a plumb line? A plumb line is to measure something up for destruction. But it's also to, to remeasure, to rebuild. So when you see God sending out messages that are tearing down, destroying, hallelujah, it means he's about to plant and rebuild. Glory to God. Right. Amen. 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 Glory to God. The next part, in verse 12, I answered the second time and, and said to him, what are these two olive branches which are besides the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? And he answered me saying, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing before the Lord of the whole earth. The word anointed one is the literal Hebrew, sons of fresh oil. Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> sons of fresh oil. It's our responsibility to get the oil in this hour. It's God's responsibility to do everything else. Amen. And how do you get the oil to be a wise virgin? The olive had to be crushed. Gethsemane. Yep is the olive press in Aramaic. So by our will being crushed in Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done, and God crushes us, hallelujah, until that pure resin is left over, that olive oil to run our lamp. That's what gets us through in this hour. And the way we get ready for these supernatural theophanies that we're in, whoo, hallelujah, these God suddenlies that are about to happen at a crease in history is, is just pray a simple prayer. I like shortcuts. How about you? I like shortcuts on my desktop. Amen? And the shortcut on my desktop is, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Yeah. That automatically qualifies you to be a son and daughter of fresh oil. Maybe you don't understand everything I may be saying, but you do understand this. You're not your own. You belong to Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And you can read the rest of Zechariah later if you'd like. But let's now go to chapter 9. All that was introduction. Hallelujah to try to get to this one moment, and we're there. It says in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 11, 9 one, one. Zechariah 9 one, one. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant which is with you, who, thank you for the blood of the covenant. Come on, folks. It speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Better things than the blood of bulls and goats. Hallelujah! The blood of Jesus. I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. That's what I saw last night. I saw an underworld of familiar spirits, demons, personalities, evil intelligences, and their whole goal was to pull people down into this underworld. Did you just know every knee will bow? Amen. Things on earth 
under the earth and in heaven, it says in Philippians chapter 2, and there is an underworld. It says in, in Isaiah that Sheol, hell, was moved to meet you. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm fired up to win souls. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to get back to winning souls. Amen. And discipling people. And standing a meter from the gates of hell, these entry points into the underworld, and rescue souls. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter where you are, always look for an opportunity. Amen. I'm at the pool with the kids, you know, and one of the, uh, uh, Deborah's friends, her father walks up to me, and he starts talking to me. And I start chatting with him, you know, and he asks what I do, and I said, oh, that's my entry point, hallelujah. And I just let it loose and just tell him what we do and all this stuff. He's like, boom. I'm talking to him, he's like, like this? And I said, so what do you do? He goes, I'm a, I'm a regional manager for Budweiser. And he is so convicted. He is so, I mean, it's like a puppy you keep on hitting 15 times in the newspaper. This guy is so convicted that he even has this job. Amen. And normally I would have kind of pulled back and changed the subject, you know? Oh, let's all about going fishing over the golf course or something, you know? And no, I just like kind of just flare up even more. And yeah. this guy is like so ashamed that he is getting so many people drunk on D DWI and breaking up families. Come on, folks. And all these things that come because of bud wires of the alcohol industry. This guy is so convicted when he's around me now. And his wife is mad at me, probably because she's really getting fear that this guy may get born again, okay, and leave his high-paying job with Budweiser, okay, and she won't have her little lifestyle at the country club anymore. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I said, good, this guy has heard about Jesus long enough. It's time for him to get pierced with conviction that he is responsible yeah. and he knows it. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Today I was driving down Hopewell here, and there was police officers here. Some car probably moved, some drunk driver last night run off the road. They just probably found the car in the woods right now. Who's responsible for that? Well, that person is, but who else? Well, the media. The media made me do it. Oh, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't, Flip Wilson. Come on. <laughs> the buck has to stop somewhere. Think about it. I meet those guys in Israel. They're arms manufacturers. They take weapons, okay, and they make them even better, and they sell them to third world nations. And they can't sleep at night. We need to have that conviction, amen? You want to shut down the alcohol industry? Start getting the executives thinking about all the kids, that, all the moms that lost their sons. Because they advertise a happy lifestyle with some beer commercial, watching a sporting event, and the kids start drinking behind the scenes. Yeah. Come on, folks. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yeah. This is what's going to wake up America. This type of rolling thunder. <laughs> Hallelujah. That there's coming a judgment day, and you are guilty. You read Jonathan Edwards' writings. You read um, uh, um, um, Finney. He came to abhor himself. I was really, uh, we got so intoxicated yesterday with the kids in front of the computer. Uh, somebody emailed me. We used to live in Brooklyn and witnessed there a lot of the Jewish community. And there was a real, one of the most famous, um, he's not, what is that called, you know? It's not uh, hip hop, yeah. It's not rap, but hip hop music. And there was a kid, uh, he's 30 years old, he's an Israeli, he lives in America now, and he has a website called 50 Shekels. You need to write this down and go visit it. 50 Shekel, S H E K E L. Dot com. 50 Shekel. He's a real famous uh, Jewish hip-hop guy, okay? And he got born again. Yeah. He's on fire for Jesus now. And it, we, I ordered his CD. He's got a song about delighting in the Sabbath that's just incredible. Go to his website. You'll love it. Shekel. 50 Shekel.com. And... Um, and we were laughing, listening to some of his music, you know, and he's out there. He's just really, he's going for it. I love it. That's what happens when Jewish people get saved. I mean, ain't no stopping them. Hallelujah. It's like putting nitro in their tank. <laughs> They'll just take off, even if the tires get burned off. They'll just go on the wheel on rims. They don't care. <laughs> 
He is so on fire. And he was one of those kids, you know, all the tattoos, you know, always talking like this, you know, <laughs> and gets born again and on fire for Jesus right now. And really, and, and, and there's a big article in, in the, uh, uh, the, one of the newspapers in New York, the Jewish community newspapers, about telling your kids, watch out for this guy, you know. <laughs> and it's really funny. He calls he call himself a Jew unit. <laughs> we need more people like that. And folks, there's a generation coming up like that. Amen? Yes. That once they've touched the waters of forgiveness, there's no stopping them. And so it says here in verse, 13, verse 12, return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This very day I'm declaring I'll restore double to you. Oh, glory to God. You like double blessings? I do. I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill the bow with Ephraim. I will stir up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and I'll make you a warrior's sword. This, to me, is one of the most powerful scriptures of the last days. So we're not in Zechariah 1 anymore, or Zechariah 4. We're now at the end of Zechariah's prophecy, which is talking about the day we live in now. We're talking about the day that God's going to open up a fountain of forgiveness in Jerusalem. Amen? These prophecies in Zechariah that in the last days we're going to um, go back to Jerusalem and, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're in this apocalyptic yes but not yet of the end time of Zechariah. This is still, this is post New Testament by the way. This is post, this, this, this prophecy right now is not Old Testament. That's what the devil wants you to think. Oh that's just old. This is, this is post-church age. This is going to happen after we're all raptured. Hallelujah. And before we're raptured, and we're all snatched away and helicoptered and come back with him. Hallelujah. We're talking about a future age where there's going to be peace and happiness. Hallelujah. I love you. You love me. We're a happy family, okay? But it's not time for that right now. It's time for violent faith. Amen. Violence. <laughs> If the kingdom of God suffered violence in the first coming of Jesus, how about the second coming of Jesus? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Whoa! You got homework. Go study the, uh, not just Elijah, study Elisha. Because yes. he had the double blessing of Elijah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Study the things that he prophesied, amen? The things that happened. But I like this, this part here. I'll stir up your sons, O Zion. Who's Zion? That's us. That's the church. Zion. Amen. Amen. You know what Zion means in Hebrew? Mitzion in Hebrew. It means your excellency. Yeah. <laughs> we can't sit around. We're people who are totally, we need to go to Buckingham Palace. We need to do a road trip one day to Buckingham Palace. Hallelujah. And just watch how everybody serves the, the royal family. Amen? Yes, Your Excellency. We live in a democracy. We're not in a, a monarchy. We need to understand this. Jesus just ain't our buddy. Amen. You know, God, you know, you're hip. You know, you're cool. Yeah. What? We are people declaring His Excellency. Somebody uses God's name in vain, you say, excuse me. Give me 20 on the floor right now. <laughs> we say, excuse me, you just blaspheme my king. In the country I'm from, we do not talk about that. What country are you from, boy? From the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> We don't talk about our king like that. All blasphemers shall burn in the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. So make your choice quickly. Okay. <laughs> we got to have a passion about ourselves. Amen? Yeah. We, we love him so passionately. If somebody you curses God's name in public, you stop and say, excuse me, if you can curse them, I can bless them. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 
That's your homework. Hallelujah. <laughs> you hear God, somebody curses God, you say, excuse me, if you can curse them, I can praise them. <laughs> but notice, I'm going to stir up your sons of Zion versus your sons of Greece. What is that? Zion's a church, Tion. Sons of Greece is what? Secular humanism. It's a humanistic flow that came out of ancient Greek, Greco-Roman thinking, Aristotle, Plato, all that stuff, which we call today secular humanism, okay, which was reinvigorated during the Renaissance, and, day is the, and today is the scourge of our society. The number of man is 666, okay? Secular humanism says man is the central of the universe, man is everything, okay? The essence of all things is man, okay? That man is still evolving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? We need to understand that is our enemy. That is the spirit of Antichrist is the sons of Greece. Derek Prince has a great teaching on this. I won't go into it. You can get one of his books called The Sons of Greece versus the Sons of Zion. Hallelujah. Sons of Zion. Excellent teaching. Now, isn't it interesting that after Daniel fought with the prince of Persia, okay, and Michael came to help, what was said next? You know what was said next? I must come back and keep praying and, you know, because, uh, excuse me, keep fighting is because the prince of Greece is coming next. And that was what concluded the prophecy of Daniel, was the prince of Greece. Secular humanism, that's what we're fighting right now. That's what fuels the abortion industry. That's what fuels, you know, killing off the old people. All this stuff, genetic engineering, it's all by humanism, brothers and sisters. And so what is God going to do? He's going to make us a warrior sword. Verse 14, come on folks, here we go. And then the Lord will appear over them. Woo! Yeah. And his arrow will go forth like lightning. Yeah. And the Lord God will blow the shofar. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. And will march in the storm winds of the south. Storm winds of the south. Yes. South. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what's coming up from the south right now? I ain't talking about a little tornado either, brothers and sisters. We're talking about a mega tornado from God's eyes. To us, it's a hurricane. The most destructive winds on planet Earth right now. Category 5, folks. Sustained winds of over 155 miles an hour is about to hit our shoreline just a few hours away. You know what, folks? And we're going to see nothing like this we've ever seen before hit these states and the amount of flooding and the twisters that are spun from this wind and it says that God himself marches in a storm wind of the south so don't tell me that this is the devil I don't know if it's God himself doing it okay but I will say this that the whole earth is out of sync All of creation, Romans 8 says, is in the thaldrums of decay, waiting for the manifestations of the sons and daughters of God. And these things are increasing, the earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Tell Greenpeace it's not about trying to cap off the ozone hole, okay? Or save the spotted owl, okay? It's about saving the humans right now. God is going to march. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to be in that thing. I've never been in a hurricane, but I've been in a lot of tornadoes. And you don't know what fear is like. And your life is like a little piece of paper floating in the wind. What it's like to be in a, a, an F5 tornado and see the devastation. And that's just a little half mile path. What's going to happen with this thing that's about to hit? I just pray it wakes up our country. You know what I'm saying? I pray that there'll be a minimal loss of life. I pray that people get born again if they are, gonna, you know, stupid enough to try to sit down there and ride it out. Well, I'm going surfing as soon as the eye wall hits. You understand what I'm saying to you? Something is happening. And this brings me to the point I want to talk about the tornado vision. 
We have back there in the book, and, all, and we're going to put it on the website soon. Maybe you have the tape, the tornado vision. And I was given a dream of a Sunday afternoon, beautiful Sunday afternoon, and everybody was getting ready to have a, coming back from church, have a barbecue in the backyard of the pastor's house. And nobody even understood what was about to hit. And I was barbecuing with the pastor, and I turned around and go inside to get a spatula to turn the chicken, and suddenly I look, and a huge F5 tornado appeared. And I ran in the house, and I began to scream to everybody, Twister's coming, Twister, Twister. And nobody in the house listened to me. You know what an F5 hurricane is, folks? Or even an F5 tornado? It's catastrophic destruction. Trees don't stand. I drove through Homestead, Florida, right after. There's no, it, was not, it was like a huge vacuum cleaner came through. And this talks about the fierce wrath of God, but talks about the storm cloud that he's moving in. Anyway, so I see this tornado appear, and I run to the house and tell all the Christians, Twister, get to the basement. Nobody listened to me. You can read about it. Nobody in the house listened to me. Actually, there was two people in that dream that later when I moved to Georgia, I saw them. The one man I looked at said, oh, you're from the tornado vision. Oh, what do you mean, boy? I saw you. And he was one of the people. He's no longer in this congregation. He left. Because he, wouldn't, he didn't believe what we were saying. And I ran to the basement because I heard this twister approaching. And I ran downstairs. And the only people that followed me downstairs were the little children. Wow. None of the grown-ups in the house listened to me. And I ran downstairs. I was getting ready to get inside the bathroom, the basement bathroom, and to cover, you know, myself over the kids in the bathtub. That's the safest place. And suddenly I look over before I close the door, and there's a pastor and his wife sitting at a large kitchen table with all these concordances and books open saying, yeah, I don't believe what Scott's saying. That's not a true word from God. God wouldn't send a tornado. God is a good God. And I knew they were more concerned about right action, than, about right doctrine than taking action. Yeah. Amen. And I just like, and I closed the door and I holded myself with the kids and we all began to scream out at intercession and suddenly the disgusting, you know, mildewy bathroom, basement suddenly became the secret place of the Most High. And I heard the twister jump up and go over the house and land on the other side. The house was rumbling. I ran upstairs. As I was running up, back upstairs, a little girl grabbed me. She was about eight years old. She had blue eyes, blonde hair. And she grabbed my arm, she pulled me back, and she says, you'll be needing this, and then handed my shofar to me. And I looked at her eyes. I did a double take, looked back at her, and she had the eyes of a 40-year-old prophetic woman. I went, whoa. And I ran up the stairs, and I ran out, and now everything was black and white. And I saw all the trees in the pastor's backyard ripped up, and I saw it was a distant valley, and down in the valley was a city. And as this storm system approached, not just one tornado, I saw 11 twisters now dropping in the city below. School buses flying in the air, blue flashes of power lines, houses exploding, people screaming. And everybody there was like, oh, whoa, whoa. But nobody was doing anything. Suddenly within me we entered this resolve to go into the valley and warn the people with the shofar what was about to happen. Didn't have time to tell the pastor. See, I told you so. I was right. And as I was running out of his yard, I saw the big electric transformer. I said, what's that doing here? Previously it was covered by growth and by bushes. I ran and suddenly I was in the inner, inner city of New York City. And I was blowing the shofar, and as I was blowing the shofar, I came up into it, and nobody was listening, but there was this wino there up against a, a street post going, oh, yeah, young man, I hear you. I believe you that tornadoes are coming. You know, but what can I do? Let's go ahead and drink and party. Tonight we're going to die. He was totally different than the people in the house that were believers. He believed me tornadoes were coming. I kept on running as I'm warning people. Suddenly, I leave New York City and I'm running down the entire eastern seaboard of North America. 
as I'm coming down the eastern seaboard and the twisters are, are, are behind me. I'm stopping, warning people. I remember vividly, I was in South Carolina <clears throat> and I stopped. There was these two couples going out for a date about my age. And I looked at them and I said, the twisters are coming. Get saved. Jesus loves you. And they said, there's no twisters around here. And they walked into a movie house, and I saw one of the twisters catch up with me and blow up the movie house, and everybody inside was killed. I kept on running, running, and suddenly I began to reach Jekyll Island and St. Simons, that area in Georgia, and then I hit Jacksonville. And as soon as I hit Florida, I suddenly was hit by a wall of people. And there's a people all over the place going the opposite direction, heading toward the tornadoes. And I was trying to warn them and stop them, and they weren't listening. And suddenly, everybody stopped on cue. And one guy, you know, was a muscle guy, so I was doing his muscles, you know. And another lady acting like, you know, she's a beauty queen, and, and people on rollerblades are like, what's going on here? And I realized that a Jewish movie producer had come out of his condominium with his girlfriend, and everybody was acting a part, trying to be like in a movie or something. I said, this is crazy. And I kept on running, and I got down to the Florida Keys, where we're going to be next week. I got down to the Florida Keys. I got as far as I could, and then the twisters caught up with me. And twisters on my left jumped into the Atlantic, became water spouts. Twisters on my right went to the Gulf of Mexico, and we're churning everything up. And suddenly, we all began to pray, and the twisters were lifted up into heaven. And I turned around to look, and I saw a whole army of Christians behind me. Hallelujah. And they're the ones who had listened. Let me tell you briefly what the, the interpretation of this dream was as we conclude. The Sunday morning doing barbecue at the pastor's house represents our current lifestyle in North America. We are blessed beyond any generation has ever known. In the house, Sunday afternoon represents churches all over America and Canada, even in Europe. Enjoying a nice service, enjoying fellowship, enjoying some time with her family, not knowing that there was an F5 tornado about to hit. Why I was shown this is I don't know why. But when I turned to get a spatula and open the screen door and I saw an F5 tornado coming, it totally traumatized me. And all I wanted to do when I saw this was try to save life. I didn't care about my own life. I wanted to save others. Unknowingly, I was being motivated by the love of God. Amen. I went to the house. People were all over the house. Not believers, good believers that loved God, but they didn't understand that a tornado was coming. They didn't want to understand. They, didn't. they wanted to wait for the NFL football game to be over first. Nobody listened to me except the children. What does the children represent? The children represents those people regardless of age or gender, that are like children who have entered the kingdom of God and are listening to what the Spirit is saying. They ran downstairs. They got into the basement bathroom. What does a basement bathroom represent? A place of abasement and humility. Your safest place in this coming storm is abasement and humility. Not basement, abasement. To humble yourself. I looked over, and there's the pastor and his wife, who by, the, by this way, when I had this vision in Delaware, which is the first state that ratified the Constitution, this is where we did our first revival meetings was in Delaware. It's very interesting is that in Delaware, that pastor, who was a Word of Faith pastor who was in the revival, is no longer in the revival. He's divorced and out of ministry because he did not listen. Hey, I'm from a Word of Faith background. I believe God is good. Amen. I believe we can speak to our, mat, our mountain. That's how wonderful, all those things. But you can't just stay in one camp. Amen? And I warned him, and he rejected the message. He rejected today. He's like, I don't know what he's doing. He's totally, it's so sad. But I knew that he wouldn't listen. I knew that what I was preaching was so opposite what he wanted to hear and what he wanted to believe. Okay? is that no matter what I said, it was more important to him to have right doctrine, okay, than to take action. Folks, you better not let your doctrine hinder you, okay? Because we know in part, we prophesy in part. And God's big, amen? It's all about action right now, amen? Not just hearing the Word, but doing the Word. 
And so I got into the basement. I heard this twister coming. I, the kids and I began to scream. And suddenly, the whole place became the secret place of the Most High, meaning the secret place is the place of protection in this hour. And it's in a place that's not in the living room where the grand piano is, okay? And all the beautiful china that you got from Germany, okay? Or Japan. And probably now China, but anyway. It's in the basement where nobody wants to go and clean. And the kids would be in to scream out. And the twister jumped over the house because of the intercession of the children. Hallelujah. When I got out of the bathroom and, and we heard the twister had missed the house, I ran up to see what happened, but you could hear the destruction. And a little girl grabbed my arm and pulled me back. That represents our current ministry. Since 1995, God's been telling us to run throughout America and Europe and Israel and other places he sends us and blow the trumpet of warning. Everybody get excited when we preach the message of blowing the shofar at the false messiah's headquarters. He drops dead 60 seconds later, okay? Miracles at Wall Street, miracles there. But when we turn the shofar into the church, it's interesting who your friends are and who your enemies are. But I work for God, not man. Hallelujah. As I went up, I saw the twisters dropping. It's amazing that the pastor's house was so beautiful up on a, a plateau that you couldn't see the plight of the inner city. All the, all the landscape was ripped out, and God was saying by this interpretation, the church can no longer ignore the plight of those in the city below. Amen. Because the strength of the American church is in suburbia, not in urban sites. The transformer in the pastor's backyard represents... And this all the interpretation came to me after I saw this vision. It came to me immediately. The transform represents the authority and power God's given the church. But instead of using it to provide light for the people in the valley below, we've adorned it with beautiful landscaping and rejoiced that we have this authority, but we're not using it for the people in the valley below. Let me represent, tell you what represents what happened in South Carolina when I saw that couple going to the movie house. I saw a fog over their eyes. Entertainment, folks, enter in to attains us. You have to be very careful what entertains you. Amen. And you have to be vigilant. Amen? Amen. Because the old Walt Disney is not the new Walt Disney. Amen. There's an attack against our minds of our culture to desensitize us. And I got to Florida, there was masses of people. What does Florida represent? And why is Florida being hit today by a hurricane? Well, Florida represented, and what God told me in the vision, Florida represents the destination for America. It's not Hawaii, it's Florida. Florida, where everybody retires and go to Florida or Arizona. Florida, in a nutshell, represents retirement, the easy life, hang out in the sun, life is a beach, entertainment. Come on, folks. Look at all the sporting events. Look at the false kingdom. Look at Orlando, what I-4 corridor is. Okay? It represents the destination, what America lives for. When I was there trying to witness this mass of people in Florida, nobody was listening. Everybody studying on cue, sort of acting like they were in some movie, as the Jewish movie readers came out. It showed me that our culture, the moral agenda, is run now by Hollywood and not by the church. Yeah. Ambitions of young people that want to be a rocket scientist are no longer rocket scientists. I want to have my own reality TV show. Folks, you have to understand, most kids want to be actors now and then ever before. As I got to the keys, it represents the end of America, and the twisters came and lifted up. Now, when I first preached this message in Florida, twisters showed up the same day I preached and hit the Miami Police Department. It's all documented in the book back there. Whenever I preach this message, twisters come. I'm not trying to take advantage right now to tell you this morning that because I'm preaching this, a twister come. 
To me, it doesn't matter if Twitchers come or not. What matters is that you get activated and you become like a child. Hallelujah. And you find that secret place. Amen? Amen. That's all that matters. I remember I was in, in, in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and I was preaching, and, and, the, and the Lord said, preach the tornado vision. As I'm preaching, suddenly the clouds grow black and luminous, and in comes in this, this thunder system, and suddenly all the volunteer fire alarm, whoo, starts going off, and you can just feel the low pressure coming in. It's like, what's going on here? And a guy runs in, pulls open the door. He says, I'm, I came to church late. I'm coming back from work late, and uh, uh, hey, hit the deck. Twisters are on the ground heading this way. And before that happened, I was, there was a lot of people in the church sitting on the front row like doing their nails, you know, just listening. And as soon as that guy ran in, and I'm preaching the tornado vision, I'm preaching tornado as the guy runs in. It was a clear sky when I started preaching. Everybody went whoosh back into, into the altar. I said, praise God, hallelujah. <laughs> And then, the, then it was all clear. And the next night, the same thing happened. Preaching a, a similar message, and the clouds came, ooh, but no twister drop. Instead, the most beautiful double rainbow appeared over the top of the church. And God told me, I'm giving America a space of repentance. Yes. Yes. That was in 1997, folks. Let's read a couple more scriptures about Tristers. It says that God is going to appear in the storm winds of the south, okay? Go with me to Zephaniah. Make a left-hand turn, about three books, and you'll hit it. Zephaniah, so you don't read very much. Zephaniah. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Nahum. A couple more books to the left. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 1, uh, let's go verse 7. It says, verse 7, the Lord is good. Well, <laughs> look at verse 7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows who takes refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood, he'll make a complete end of its sight. Whoa. So you say, it's God is good. I agree with that, but why don't you read the first verse before you start getting all hyped up that God is only good all the time. Verse 1, the oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Ecclesite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. The low is slow to anger, great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished in the whirlwind or tornado and storms of his way, and the clouds are dust beneath his feet. This huge system is just dust under his feet. It says, in the whirlwind, the tornado, a whirlwind could be a hurricane also, just a bigger one. This is the Lord's way. It says in Job, if you'd like to see that, turn with me to the book of Job, right before the book of Psalms. What it says about tornadoes. Job 38 and verse 1, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, the tornado, and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, I believe the book of Job has been misquoted and mistranslated by many evangelical Christians, and they're using the book of Job to spring off what I call seeker-sensitive services. Oh, God is sovereign. God giveth and God taketh away. Blessed be his holy name. Let's all come together, okay, and let's just have a nice social club Christianity. And leaders are darkening the counsel of God. And look at what it says here in verse 1. He came out of the whirlwind, the tornado. Who is this who darkens counsel by words about knowledge? The reason God came to a in a tornado to Job is because he wasn't preaching what was right about him. And I'm convinced that God is not going to put up with this, this mamby-pamby, Winnie the Pooh message is being printed. It's very popular today. 
that's being preached in America especially, okay, which is a leader of the church worldwide by these leaders who don't even understand what God's really saying. God's going to come and shake things up. Because the people don't listen to the prophets and prophets as God has no other recourse but to come in his motor car, which is a whirlwind. <laughs> Go to Jeremiah. You say, well, Scott, I don't understand this. Well, maybe we're not supposed to understand everything. You know, knowledge puffs up. What's the driving force behind knowledge? To learn, to know, to understand, to conquer, control. That's pride. I had a professor at ORU, and we'd ask him questions all the time. And he'd say, young men and women, listen to me. And he's, you know, he's a Ph.D. from Brandeis, and one of the translators, NIV version. And Dr. Roy Hagen, he'd always say, I'm going to teach you something. I want you to memorize this. This is worth your entire college education, your master's degree. One of the best answers you can give people is, I don't know. <laughs> Because the Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. Because there is a stimulus in learning. You can get drunk and just learning and learning and learning and learning, but never take action. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 23 is an amazing text that shows us we're not supposed to understand everything. I'm not saying that God's sending tornadoes to kill babies and car wrecks and people dying of leprosy or whatever. Um, listen, folks, there is a devil, and he's come to kill, steal, and destroy, okay? But beyond that is an apocalyptic grand finale of the book of Revelation where we see God pouring out plagues on the earth, God shaking everything that can't be shaken. Let's give God his rightful place, okay, not blame everything on the devil. That's an insult to God. The devil is a created being. He's not omnipotent. He's not an omniscient. And amen? He's not all powerful. He's a deceiver, okay? He's a spirit that's been thrown out of heaven. That's, and you know what? And he's not in hell yet, but he's going to be. And there's a dark underworld of his agents, okay? And they're not as powerful as you think. Amen? Thank God for the blood of the covenant. And God wouldn't be raising up the sons of Zion as a warrior sword to fight against the sons of Greece. It's going to be some yin-yang battle. Good, evil, good, evil. Come on. We're being raised up because God's, because we, God's already wrote the playbook. We win. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 23, behold the tempest of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tornado or tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days you will understand this. The word tempest is the same Hebrew word for tornado or hurricane. We don't understand it, Okay. But in the latter days, we will. There's certain things we don't know. The best thing you can do is put it on the shelf. I don't understand why that's happened. Amen? But keep on going with the things we do know. Let's conclude with Proverbs. The book of Proverbs also talks about twisters and tornadoes. Or I should say hurricanes. It says in verse 23... Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23, turn to my reproof. Proverbs 1 verse 23, behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. Notice, if you want a deep feeling of the Holy Spirit, always turn to when God reproofs you. Reproof, prove, reprove, prove, rewind, prove, rewind, amen? When God speaks to you about a certain character issue, okay, whatever it may be in your life, Okay, turn to that reproof because that's when you get fillings of the Spirit. Not just when you put on a happy music. Behold, I'll make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand, no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel, did not want my reproof. Wow. I will even laugh at your calamity. I'll mock you when dread comes. Folks. 
I mean, listen, I'm not God, okay? But I'm reading the Bible here. I see things that really makes me upset with these yahoos out here that are presenting a different God. Amen. And we've got to become violent in faith, amen? amen? Oh, you know, don't say that God sent 911. Oh, don't say that God, you know, uh, did this tsunami, okay, that happened on Christmas Day. Wait a minute. What if one of those hotels was the center of pedophile industry? Which that area is. Who says God hasn't been sending prophets through there? There's a lot of Christians in Thailand. When your dread comes like a storm, verse 27, poof, come on folks, please, put yourself in Panama City or Mobile, Alabama right now, at a hurricane, it's almost, I ain't talking about just it comes through like a tornado and moves on, I'm talking about hours of sustained winds that will throw a hockey stick through a tree. Lord, I just pray for all the people that are about to be influenced by this hurricane and the resulting twisters and storms that will come and flooding. Father, I pray that when their dread comes like a storm, that they'll call out to you, Jesus. They'll remember their first love and how far they've fallen away. And Lord, maybe there's a Jonah. Maybe you're sending the huge storm to go after one person. That's working on an oil platform in the Gulf or working in Mobile, Alabama on a shipyard or something. And they've got a call of God on their life and they're not obeying. And you're sending this storm. Lord, bring the Jonas out of mouth mothball fleet. Bring the Jonas out of hiding. Hallelujah. And verse 27, the last part, and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, a tornado. When distress anguish come on you,